No, maybe not. Let's go straight into it. So I'm going to hand over right now to Andy. Thank you. Yeah. Can I have a hurt? There is one. All right, good. So I, I tried, tried to do some finish here with Google Translate. I'm pretty sure it's very accurate. <laughs> oh, it's great. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to speak about networking, and then we're going to be talking a little about physical networking here, and uh, not so much about protocols and stuff. Um, my name is Freddy Korsbeck, usually known as Kumke, which can mean a lot of different things in various languages, especially in Danish. And also, I work for a Danish company. Uh, so this slide says Sunit here, uh, but I have another slide which says Nordnet here, and that is because I work for both companies. So I'm actually employed by Nordnet, uh, which is a joint project by all the five Nordic immigrants, which is special research and education networks, uh, where Foodnet is the Finnish one and it's one of my owners. Uh, we operate a uh, transit and um, peering network, which is called AS2603. And we've been going about this for a while, very long time. Uh, and uh, we sub-operate 100G TWDM network all the way from Helsinki to all the way through Europe and then we have least capacity to the US. And we're part of a various project for Atlantic capacity, uh, which is called ANA 200, which will soon be ANA 300, which is 300 people over the Atlantic Sea. Uh, we have 19 worldwide hops in, um, in the world of expanding every year to more pops to serve the needs of our customers. Uh, we currently have about two terabit seconds of uh, possible connectivity, uh, and we peak at around 600 G, and this is for commercial purposes, like the Netflix and the Facebooks. We also have a lot of capacity at a lot of other weird place for, for scientific purposes, such as supercomputing and, uh, I don't know what they do, they just do weird stuff uh, towards CERN and, and these kind of facilities. Uh, yeah, I guess if you read. Uh, we wanted to try more networks for a very long time, which is kind of cool because Scandinavia is small, as the American Planet pointed out here, that no one essentially knows where Scandinavia is. And uh, we're considered one of the big ones together with Geo, which is the European one, and Internet 2, which is the American one. And why Europe is divided into two is because John is, is run up from uh, Cambridge and uh, may not be as flexible as others. This is why we are not connecting only Scandinavian networks anymore. We also do business with the Russians, with Estonians, <coughs> and uh, with um, people from the Netherlands, because they are that fond of Cambridge. Anyway, or maybe Cambridge is not fond of that. All right, so to the two people. This is a network, not that interesting. We have been doing public stats since the 80s. Uh, you can do a little look yourself at stats.com.net, and we Everything we do is more or less publicly, and uh, full disclosure. Right? Let's speak about Sunet. Sunet is the um, Swedish army network, which is the equivalent of Funet. And we're building new networks, and we're trying to uh, build something new and something exotic. And uh, trying to build it cheap. And also we're trying to punch holes in some old myths with this network. Right. So first we look at the current topology. We have uh, essentially two networks. Uh, which is full redundant to each other. There, this is fiber network connecting the whole Sweden. And uh, there's a red and a green network. And uh, it's been going on for about 10 years. It's called Optosunde. And the whole system is a big star coming out of Stockholm. So everything here is, in, in the first design, you only have two routers in Stockholm essentially. And then everything else was just laid to transport to DWDM on our own uh, least fibers. So on our own dot fiber. Uh, this obviously has a few problems because from Kiruna to Stockholm, there's about 1,000 kilometers, which makes that when, when people in Kiruna want to speak to people in Lille, you that quite a late latency, right? So, but that's what we could afford at that time. Uh, this has evolved during this, so we actually have um, local routing up in Lille, we have local routing in Gothenburg, and local routing in Malmö to solve these kind of problems that all traffic doesn't have to go to Stockholm. Uh, this is uh, Siena DWDM. Uh, we have about 120 pops in uh, Sweden, and there's a junior per hours in the end. Right, drawbacks, a lot of them. Uh, you can also see, because this is a star, right? So if there's a fiber break here on the green <coughs> network, you will lose everything that goes from Stockholm up north, which is a lot of capacity, and it's a lot of bandwidth. 
and uh, everything needs to go out to the web network. Uh, which is it, uh, that funny. We'll actually have only one fiber break in 10 years' time that actually cut both networks. It was cut here, outside the town of Vestros. Both of these were cut. Uh, it was supposed to be 10 meters uh, at all places in Sweden where the fiber um, had to be 10 meters from each other. And uh, when you do, uh, I don't know what the word is, but when you dig under a road, you have this big drill. So first the, the green network went, and then when they go on the, under the road, and then on the other side was the red network, so it takes both cables. So it was great. So we had, um, that was about four hours of total down, downtime for the whole west region, which was this. Which is, uh, we're still debating about the SLAs on that one. It's going to be hopefully a good, good party after that. I don't know. Anyway, time to build new ones. Why are we building a new network? Uh, that is because we're uh, government funded, so everything needs to be controlled by tenders. And uh, someone was very wise 10 years ago in that all tenders was finished at the same year, which is this year, 2016. The fiber tenders went out, the router tender went out, and the optical gear tender was out. Which means that we legally need to buy a new network. Uh, <laughs> which is kind of weird, right? But, uh, also, there was, I mean, there was a 10 and 40, 40G network, the old one, um, and uh, the cost was just, just not enough, and we couldn't scale it. That's good. So we need to, need to figure something out. And the first tender we did was for optical, oh, sorry, for, for dark fiber. And um, we decided, it seems long, that we're not going to build a star network anymore, because the routers are cheap nowadays. There wasn't 10 years ago. The routers were extremely expensive, so we couldn't, we couldn't only afford to buy two. Uh, now we can afford to buy a lot more routers. On the other hand, optical gear is kind of quite expensive, especially when we go in the 100 gig area. <coughs> so what we did was we did a um, <coughs> new type of network, which uh, has, as you can see, three paths through Sweden. And all this is actually divided into small uh, rings, which we'll see in a later slide. Um, and um, of course, we wanted to uh, be able to provide much higher capacity for, for certain needs. There is uh, five super uh, super data centers in Sweden, uh, which does um, all type of uh, computational work for, for CERN, for example, which is one of the main, main applications for the Swedish grid, grid computers. Uh, so we bought a new network, a dog fiber network, and uh, all this is essentially an aerial fiber, so it goes in the top line of, of um, high voltage um, grid. And uh, one thing we had in the tender was that we need the KMC data, which is exact where every fiber is located on every meter. That is because we don't want to go in that like we did in the last one, and we find out a lot of places where these networks actually interjoin when, when, when we're supposed to. So from the, from the new provider, which is Tele2, by the way, uh, which has a lot of, lot of fiber um, because they bought power companies in, in, in the 15 years ago. So what we ended up was with uh, about 8,000 kilometers of fiber, which is less fiber than the last network. And uh, then of course we have access fiber from the, um, to the universities. Uh, and this is impossible to get KMC data from, because in every city there is a, some kind of city-owned type of network, and, and some of them are really good. They have really good data on where all the fiber are, where every, everything is interconnected, but most of them don't. So it was just, we couldn't put it in a tender, we tried to, no one could answer it. Everyone said, yeah, so KMC data for backbone, sure, that's fine, we can do it. But access network, not gonna happen. And the design from the beginning, it wasn't that we, we could potentially build a classical network, which means that we build a big DW network and you put routers in the end, and then we speak Ethernet and have the DWM equipment sort of long thing. So this is where, where we come to the, to the stuff which is kind of exotic, right? So this was tried a little bit in the 10G world. It was, as far as I know, no, no, no one that did it in the 40G era, if it, is, if it even was an era. But in 100 gig, a lot of people, and especially data center people, they, they don't want to buy DW equipment. They, I mean, they're going to need it, but they want to buy as little as possible. And we have the same, same idea, because we don't have any optical engineers. We have one, but I mean, they're old, so we don't, we don't want them, and, and we don't want to hire more of them. So what to do? In a, in a classic, classical network, you usually have a router, and then you have some kind of Ethernet interface, 
that goes into a transponder in a DWM equipment. And this transforms the, the Ethernet signal to something that can be transported along more, uh, usually OPM of some sort. In, in the 100 g world, it's, uh, it's uh, OTM is only, actually. And you have the MUXES, you have amplifiers in the path to get the whole stretch, and then, then you convert back into Ethernet when you reach your uh, final destination. So what we want to do is that we want to do framing of OTM directly in the routers to save money and to have flexibility. I can't say that the optical vendors were especially fond of this idea. Actually, we did a tender uh, quite early, it was one and a half year ago, and we got zero answers. And I mean, we still, we still buy stuff for 70, 70 million Swedish, but none of the optical vendors were, were interested in this money because we destroyed the, destroyed the market. Because all, I mean, for, for the optical vendors, that's all Nokia, Nokia was here, could probably tell you that, that a lot of money is in this transponder. This is where you can make revenue off. And that, that is fine, of course. I mean, you need to adhere to your, to your own market, but we don't care about that. We don't care about the, that the optical vendors need to survive. We want to survive because we need to provide a cheaper network because our customers, in this case, all the universities, all the science facilities, all this type of stuff in Sweden, they didn't want to pay more money for a network, they want to pay less money, which I guess is probably a universal law everywhere. So we need to find out a cheaper solution. So one of the problems we had, which could be a tip for if anyone wants to build a network in this case, that, that sure, there was a vendor that could probably arrange this. And, and because we wouldn't just want to buy Muxus, Mediaphase, and probably Rodems, which is optical switches essentially, from, from the optical vendors, and they sold they're not selling transponder solution with licensing fees. They just put licensing fees for external transponders, and incidentally, they cost exactly the same as buying a transponder from them. Which is like, all right, that's, that, that, that's cool. Um, but we did actually succeed with the tender, because someone needs to bulge, right? Because there's still a lot of money, so some, someone needs to provide this. And I think it's on the next slide. Right, that's on the back. But so what, what happened is that we, when we did it the next time, we said, sure, we, can, we will buy optical stuff, but there's no licensing fees at all for external wavelengths. And there was two vendors that actually wanted to do this. It was Adva and uh, Cisco. Right. So, but we need some, we need the OTM framer. And in this case, it was uh, Juniper that won the tender uh, for, for IP over DWM equipment. And here comes the tricky part, uh, which is spec, which is super boring to speak about, uh, unless you're interested in this case, but it's actually extremely important. Uh, there's something, fact is what you, what you do to actually be able to just come out of the building. It's for forward connection, and you need it to, to do long haul, essentially. Uh, and uh, th th this is part of the LTM standard, by the way. There's something they call sub-decision uh, which is uh, um, SD fact which is um, everyone does their own SD effects. Sienna does their own SD effects, Cisco does their own SD effect, um, Nokia does their own SD effect, Infineera, Transmod, all of them have their own, and everyone thinks they're the best. And since this is secret sauce, right? No one can speak to each other. So you can't take a SD effect transponder from an Infineera and have it speak to a Corian uh, transponder with, with an SD effect mode. So what, what, what we had, which made a lot of people upset, was that we require something called high gain spec, or staircase spec, or cortina spec. Uh, I guess there's very a lot of names, which is, I wouldn't call it open source, but it's it's at least a common way of doing this, how to how spec is put onto the signal. And uh, it was a company called Cortina, uh, which is now called Invite. They did this, and they, they released it to the public that this is how you can do our spec. It's probably not as good as the most advanced SP effect ones, but it's fine for every con every country except maybe if you want to go stay east to west coast in, in, in the US. We have run this uh, high gain staircase spec for about 1,800 kilometers, which is uh, probably fine for Sweden and a lot of other countries as well. And what, what is cool here is that the router vendors, they obviously want to get this market. So, all the router vendors we have talked to has implemented high gain spec in their equipment. Uh, so we have done interrupts with several vendors, especially our friends at the Deutsche Telekom. Uh, we've done interrupt between Juniper, Cisco, 
Nokia, or well, Nokia that was at the time, and Huawei. Uh, so they can speak to each other uh, with different vendors in this high gain technology. And in this Juniper car that we bought, uh, there's also the soft association pack which is bought from Acacia, which is a company that sells uh, SD pack or SD pack cards, um, like Broadcom sells switch chipsets. So they are commercial off the shelf. So Juniper hasn't made anything of this by themselves, they just buy it from someone else. And, uh, and incidentally, a lot of rubber vendors are choosing to buy from the same one. So we have actually done interrupt as well between Cisco and Juniper in SD effect mode, which makes Infineera very, very sad, which is uh, funny, of course. Now there's a uh, GPEG mode, which is uh, not very good, but it could be totally viable for very short, short term solution, like maybe 200 kilometers, something like that, or less. Right, so in this uh, Juniper card, there is a CP2 ACL, which is analog. That means that there is no DSP in the transceiver. The DSP is right on the card. And I, oh, the picture is here. So you can see that there is two, uh, two big uh, cooling, something, what are they called? And these are the SD pack ASIC and the high gain pack ASIC. So you can put them in, in, the, in either mode. Can be both at the same time. And uh, this is for Nemex, so this is just one cord, which makes it not very dense, especially for the new cards you can buy for Nemex, which is like 1600. But this was, uh, we bought this card uh, because the price was good, because we didn't more, we don't need more capacity at this current time, more than, more than 100 gigs. Uh, so what we bought for the network, we bought DWDM from ABBA, FSP 3000, and we only bought uh, amplific amps and rodents, and the whole system is gridless, which means that we have no fixed muxes. So every mux is uh, essentially just splitters and combiners. <coughs> this is, uh, have two different reasons for this. Is that most people run with a fixed 50 gigahertz uh, muxes, uh, because that is what the channel usually is, has been for a very long time, especially in 10G world. But in the future, we have seen, or actually tried already, 400G and 1 terabit cards, and these have weights that could be 200 gigahertz, 300. And uh, also less, I mean, a 100 G wave today could be 37 uh, gigahertz, which means they can scram 120 into the, into the DW spectrum, which is kind of cool. Um, also, because we have a lot of um, other use cases than just transporting IP, we have a lot of, in uh, Gothenburg, we have a uni uni um, university which they, they do research on, on lasers. So they have ultra stable lasers which they shoot through the world. Uh, for some reason, I don't know. But they, they want to shoot lasers over the world, which doesn't carry any signal. It's just they do it, it's only the light source that needs to be transported. And that signal could be anywhere from, from 30 gigahertz to 300. So we can, we can adopt this. And uh, Juniper won the tender for routers, uh, incidentally, because they have the, the worst, or at least the, the least dense DWM card, which also means the lowest price. Uh, Cisco has Ray SAR as well, but that is a two port card, which means that it's quite expensive. Right? So, this is uh, optical. And um, essentially, what it looks like, and then uh, there's like small rings here. Where all these blue boxes are rodents. A rodent is an optical switch, so we can choose to drop wavelengths or let the wavelengths pass through. Uh, and in all these places, there is a university or any type of other research facility that wants waves, uh, or rather, a router that wants waves. And um, there is, uh, um, what do you say? Up to Louis is quite far, right? Even though it looks like very compact. So this uh, this third one here, the one from goes from Karlstad all the way up to Okeroke, that's like 1,200 kilometers. <laughs> That's a long stretch. This, there's no amplifiers written out on this this uh, this one. But it's probably between Karlstad and Motoki, I believe there's ten amplifiers. And uh, okay. Also, since Sweden is um, located very good in between Norway and Finland, so we actually provide um, external capacity to the, the Norwegian and the Finland as well up in Lulu. So they can have, re have redundancy because Norway has a problem that they only have two fiber spans through Norway. In Norway, like in the middle of Norway, it's very, very thin. So they have at least three times the last three years they have 
uh, breaks of blood fiber, which cuts Norway in half. And now they have an emergency path through Sweden. Right, so next thing, which is, uh, I guess, a bit controversy, that, that, I mean, we need to save money. And usually when you build a network like this, you probably put, this is the main city, so this is the main pop. To, to build redundancy, you usually put two routers inside and have each of the customer connected to one of each router. But we couldn't do that because we couldn't afford to buy so many routers. So what we did is we buy one more of these coherent parts instead. So here is a customer. It's called HH, which is Hugs, Pura, and Hamza. You have two routers. One of the routers is connected locally in the same city, which goes to the pop in the main city. But the other one has a coherent card, so it shoots through the optical system to the neighboring city. This uh, enables us to buy half as many pop routers as we needed, uh, because we can uh, utilize the op optical network we already have. <coughs> And a more detailed look on how it could look uh, in a city. So one of the routers will be connected with 100G LR4, just regular signal mode optics that goes 10 kilometers. And uh, in the time loop, we control that one of the fibers from the pop to the customer must be able to run, must be 10 kilometers or less, so we can run LR4. So this goes straight into the to the MX router on the top, and the other one is the 100G coherent which goes through the optical system and doesn't only actually passes down the fire and goes to the next city. I know there's no Swedish in this slide, uh, but yeah, I guess you have to do that. And now, uh, what is that? All right. <coughs> and on, on the other side, we'll also put this, uh, these filters, these gridless filters, so if, if we ever have the need to provide something else, and for example, that we need to provide that the university or the design facility needs to shoot, for example, a very stable laser to hammer it, Fine, because we have, we have filters there that's able to accept a signal of any sort. We don't care much about what's in the signal. And the shopping list for this, so the old universities is getting MX480s. Uh, the smallest ones, all the pops, we're going to use 960s. And for the, for the big core sites in Malmö, Gothenburg, Lulu, and Stockholm, we're going to use big MX2000 uh, series. And the reason why we buy so big routers is because these coherent cards, as you, as you said, uh, or as, you, as you shown before, they're not very dense. It's just 100 e port per slot. And this one can actually has 1.6 terabit per slot uh, with uh, all the, the latest and greatest stuff. So we're sacrificing a lot of backlink capacity, but it was the only, only choice that made sense economically. To do this because buying these box that's, that's not expensive, or well, depending on who you are, but I mean, it's, just, it's just metal, right? It, it doesn't contain any, any, any magic stuff, it's just metal. So, going from, from a chassis like this to a chassis like this, and just speaking about the chassis, not that much. The car is very expensive, though. Some pictures from going out because we're actually building the network right now, so I, I, I was not even supposed to go here because I was supposed to build stuff. But, but uh, I don't know, I guess it was, I, I guess it could go anywhere, right? So, we're trying to build as much of this by ourselves. We're only three people uh, from Nordenet that does this for Sunet. So we drive around everywhere and we have local handymans that helps us carry routers and, and uh, stuff like that. We connect electricity and all this kind of stuff. But uh, we, we, we like to do the stuff by ourselves, so that's what we drive around everywhere. Uh, some more pictures on this installations look like. This is a great picture of a rotom looks like, and we're not buying a single transponder from optical vendors. Everything is going to be, in, uh, it's going to be, all signals is going to be originated from a router on the BWM parts. And uh, if we, this is a kind of automatic Perl script that, that, that did this. So this is with all, all the ILAs as well. <laughs> all of this is actually a pop of some sort. Some is just a very, uh, small shed out in the forest. Some of these are big data centers. So it it's, uh, varies a lot. Uh, so we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of administrative <laughs> things that we care about when we have so many pops and slides. Uh, there is like, does this side have power? Does it have UPS? Does the keys work? So we've been spending a lot of time, much more than we anticipated, to just get these kind of things sorted. And one thing to notice there, because we have, we have promised to have three paths to every region, and if you decide, if you divide Sweden into five pieces, 
um, we want free free redundancy to, to all of it. And, and this south port here actually doesn't have it. This has two here. So what we did, what we needed to do was that we consulted Northern Net, which incidentally we also work for. Uh, and they have another fiber network, which is not in aerial fibers because that is in ground fiber. So we're going to lease spectrum from Northern Net in this case to go from Malmö all the way up to Stockholm to have a third path for South of Sweden. Because there just isn't enough fiber in South of Sweden to provide three full paths. And that comes the new creature, which should have three paths to every region. Which hopefully means that we will avoid any type of total outage in the future. Alright. Now comes really boring stuff, unless you're interested in this. That, that is that we use, in terms of amplifiers, people have been using EDFA amplifiers for, for centuries. And these are regular amplifiers, which works in regular way that they take a fast signal, pumps it up, and goes out with a strong signal. But since we need to have this network for a very long time, all the optical gear is written off in 10 years, which is probably a lot longer than, than most other carriers do. Uh, and uh, so we need to prepare for, all right, what's going to happen in 10 years? So we've been speaking to Juniper, to Cisco, to Nokia, to all, also all these uh, uh, merchant silicon ASIC people that, all right, what's going to happen with 400G? What's going to happen with one terabit? What does the optical network need to provide? to be able to run a one terabit channel from Stockholm to Malmö, which is about five to and seven hundred kilometers. And all of them said that you need really good OSNR. And that is optical signal from the moisture rate here. And to get this, EDFA is just not good enough. Then you need to put EDFAs every 50 kilometers, which no one can afford. So you need something called Rama, which I haven't fully understood how they work, but they amplify the wrong direction. So they send out the burners Four very strong <coughs> signals in the, in the transceive direction, or oh, well, in the receive direction, to to excite the channel and carry it further. So we actually have in most places we have these hybrid amplifiers. They are both EDFA and RAM, so they amplify in both directions. And this is to get the OSMA. So in every place we want to have better than 70 dB. And this probably is gibberish for a lot of people, but it's very important when building in the future to, to, to get this because there's so much physical limitation in terms of op optical transport that we, we need this. And also, we need bigger channels. We probably need 150 gigahertz channels to be able to do 400G and one terabit channels, which is probably going to be the future um, type of signals you want. There, there's 100G now, 150, 200, 250, all these which are proprietary and, and uh, Cisco has some weird, like 175 G channel, which is super weird. But 401 T is probably going to be the next big thing after 100 G. We believe it. And with this setup, you will probably be able to keep random wires for the whole um, lifespan of the network. And this has to be easy, I can say, because fiber is kind of hard. Uh, well, it's not hard, it's actually very easy, but it's People don't respect fiber networks. They, they just connect things and like, all right, we have signal, all right, good, it works. Um, so this is a OTR sub, sub, subsection of the fiber, which is uh, a little bit over 100 kilometers long. And uh, this looks fine. I mean, this, this will probably fly at most people. Most uh, optical people just say, oh, that's good. I mean, there's, there's a few connectors here. All these uh, red lines here are probably a connector or a splice. Yes? Oh, oh sorry, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but if we zoom into this, it's actually not good, right? Uh, this, this, this is the first uh, 500 meters. And there's a lot of splices here. All this causes reflection. And reflection is very bad for Raman amplifier because Raman amplifiers probably does send out the, the light at about plus 18 dB. And if there's a lot of reflection, what do you, what, what, what do you even start? And this was the case, this fiber, Raman wouldn't even start. And if we have spent 15k euro, buying our monitor fire, we of course want it to work. So we have been bashing fiber providers in Sweden. We're the most hated company in Sweden uh, when it comes to, to dealing with fiber because this is not acceptable. And the good thing is the tender controls this very, very hard. So they have, they have nothing on us. So they just need to go out to fix, splice it, microscope every, every single connector and, and clean. And they need to have you know, polish all the kind of stuff. And then they're not very happy with us. But on the other hand, I spoke to, to the to transport guys, Facebook, and, and they actually have 
the exact same transport network as we do, because we only save parking spots, and they have the exact same problem. So now it's going to be easier for them, which is good. So we're, we're, we're working together in that and in bashing, bashing local fiber providers to, to actually, that they, 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 this, this is not cool. This is probably the best connector we have. This is a microscope picture from an OEF in, in a hut somewhere out in Sweden. And this is, this is, this is good. I mean, it's not good for us, but it's like, it's their version of good. We have, we have connectors that has yes, dirt on the whole connector, nothing that good. Like four dB loss in the connector, which is, I mean, that's, that's not good. That's not fine work. Uh, there's also the thing with, uh, with old fiber, there's something called water peak value, which is that Raman actually uses four, four wavelength. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it sends out the, to excite. And uh, all fiber has very high dampening of certain wavelength, which is 30 to 83 na uh, nanometers. And um, this is also a problem, and this is, what we're gonna do about this is that the good thing is that when you do this area type of fibers, you probably put out like 100 pairs of fiber, because when it's not, not the fiber that's expensive, it's the work, right? So they put a lot of fiber um, out. So, this is going to be for the next year. We're going to try to find the best ones, which is also in the temperature that we need the best possible fiber we can get. And we have another fiber that looks like this, which is really um, taking down the effectiveness of, of the Ramana fires. Uh, so this is going to be fixed as well, hopefully. If not, then we're going to need to put sites in the middle and um, put more amplifiers in. This is what a common site looks like. This could be a pop site or an amplifier site. <coughs> Somewhere out, usually along there's power grid in the back you can see, and uh, so we have a lot of fancy uh, keys and passage cards to, to, to get into these places. And uh, there's backup generators on every side, which is usually not a hard thing for them to provide because they're in a like power grid facility, so there's usually enough power to to go around. And uh, but these are quite small sites, and since we want to put routers here. Uh, this is, I mean, this is not your generic data center, right? So, and most people they just put amplifiers which are 30 centimeters deep. But we wanted to put big routers there, which cause a lot of problems. So you can see there's a rack here, which is our rack, on sliding wheels. And uh, this is because we need to get the, on the, in the back of the routers to be able to exchange power supplies, to be able to connect power supplies. And the, the solution from, from the vendor was to do like this, which is kind of cool. So they could pull Wall bearings on the rack on the slides in, in the in, in the floor, and cable chains in the top to have the fiber and and, uh, and power just slide along with the rack. And we did a very science scientific test to have uh, uh, MX960 full load is about 158 kilos. These two dudes, it's about 158 kilos. And uh, even my kids could uh, could uh, uh, pull the rack back and forth. And to be able to configure this stuff, because we, we arranged like local electricians to install the routers. They don't want to console an MX router, upgrade the software, set IP addresses, configure MPLS, ISIS, all this stuff. So what we do is that we order 4G connections to every single site, or rather we make sure that there was reception there. And since Tele2 is a mobile provider, this wasn't a big problem for them. So we bought this open gear uh, console service, which has 4G connections which goes in a, in a private VPN for office, which means that all boxes are sent out completely empty. And uh, the only thing that is that the detail in those comes pre-built, and that is because we don't trust anyone about one minute. That is because we don't trust people that they connect stuff properly. We have so much problems with people just putting in fibers, we require that every single connector is going to be scoped, and that we need to get pictures of the scope of the, when they did the inspection, and that they're fully qualified for this uh, IEC 706 test something. Uh, so they did it in the factory instead. So the only thing that does so in, in the road is is they connect the line fiber and it's done. But we configure everything from, from remote to the 4G connections. And I know I, I really don't have time to explain this, but this is a very high level picture how it would look like at the university. So they have two routers, one local connection to the same city and one remote connection to the neighboring city. Um, there is some DWM in between. And for the logical part, which is very basic here, but this is one of the ideas we have that people probably want. The university, they just run, act like a regular ISP customer. They run EVGP, 
uh, towards their routers and uh, they have their own names number and they take care of their own IP, IP address and such. And uh, the thing is that the campuses usually don't want to buy big routers for obvious reasons. And since we've already bought them, uh, this is going to be how we do it actually. So we're actually going to slice these unit routers into two pieces into logical systems and we act as the campus router well, they just get the campus router from us because we have both router anyway. Uh, so this is the free of charge service we, we provide. So we're gonna the SUNET network is gonna run in the logical system in these student routers where we do all the uh, MPLS, ISIS, multi-cost stuff. And the cus customer here takes the main instance and uh, uses it as their campus core, which we actually been doing this for seven years, which is probably the only one in the world that does this at least according to Juniper, because they get very surprised every time we mention this. But it has been working for seven years, and we hope that it's going to work for seven more. Um, and uh, every test suggests that it, that it just works. And why they get the main instance is because some things doesn't work in logical system that they might need, like move to chassis lag and stuff like that, which we don't need. Right, skip this. This could probably be interesting, because we don't like the optical vendors and MS systems, because they're crap. I mean, all of them are crap. Everyone is equally crappy. So what we want to do is want to, I could put the word SDN in here, but I am going to make that term. Uh, so the, the, in the first iteration, we're going to have the, the Adva NMS. We, we actually have to buy it. Um, so we bought that one, and we're controlling the Juniper coherent cards from the Adva NMS. So they're going to act as, as an alien transponder. But in the future, we want to get rid of the NMS because we don't like NMS. Because we have already built our own, right, for, for uh, router, uh, router co co configuration, which is incidentally from Cisco, which is kind of weird. But it wasn't at the time of, uh, it was before. <coughs> but in the future, which is the 2018 plan, is that we have this provisioning system from Cisco, uh, which is going to provision the routers and the <coughs> rodents and every element in the network. And uh, if it's this polite, we're not sure yet. Uh, but it was. Before it was from a company called Taylor, which is a Swiss company, which I get pulled up. And we use Netcom Yang to provision everything. So that has also been something we've been intended that we're not going to buy a single equipment, not a single screw or anything that doesn't speak Netcom Yang, because we want to build all the configuration with his router, his switches, or if it's rodents, or whatever it is, we need to be able to build configurations in Yang models, which we can push over through Netcom. And I think I'm done with my time. Uh, but this is the general idea of the timeline. So we're somewhere in the summer here. Uh, we're not going to market customers during summer because it turns out the customer is actually on vacation. Uh, so we can market them when they're back. But this gives us a little bit more time to finish the core. We're about 85% done with the core rollout. And uh, we're getting access fibers starting Monday, which means that we can at least start getting some customers uh, links up. We're going to migrate them in October number. And on last December, the whole network is going to be shut down for sure. Uh, which means that we're quite an hour. Right, so questions, I will be in the sauna, you can find me on IRC, uh, hope you can mail me, you can read my blog, uh, and this is a very full disclosure type of blog, we're gonna, we can speak about anything, not, not, nothing is secret, which uh, some people like to hear about. I think that's it. Thank you very much. To play your size, yes. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, it's definitely Excel. Okay. Definitely.